Good morning and good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's ArcServe webinar looking at some more of the new features introduced in ArcServe UDP version 6.5. My name is Armin Jehanian, I'm a pre-sales consultant for ArcServe and I'll be presenting today's session. Before we get started, during today's session if anyone has any questions please feel free to use the chat or the questions pane to type those questions in and we'll address those uh, towards the end. During today's session, we'll have a quick overview of what the ArcServe UDP solution entails. We'll have a summary of the new features that have been introduced in UDP 6.5, at least the key new features. And then we'll take a look in detail how to use and implement the, some of the new features, specifically how to copy recovery points to cloud, how to perform virtual standby into AWS, and how to perform instant VM into AWS. As I mentioned, this is the second webinar of the new feature series. And if you missed the first webinar where we covered uh, file share backups, um, Office 365 Exchange Online backups, uh, and automated uh, VM protection and SLA reporting. Uh, there will be a link uh, in a few slides time that shows the, uh, the URLs where you can watch that webinar on demand. With that, let's take a quick look at ArcServe UDP. For those of you who have already used ArcServe UDP or are uh, using it already, uh, none of this will be a huge surprise. But what ArcServe UDP does is brings together what were previously three separate products in the form of ArcServe Backup, which was our traditional file-based backup primarily to tape, uh, ArcServe Replication and High Availability, or ArcServe RHA, which gives us our new real-time byte-level replication and automatic failover capability, as well as the ArcServe UDP core component, which is based on the former ArcServe D2D product. So by bringing these together, what we're doing is we're bringing them into a unified architecture, and that's where the UDP name comes in. So ArcServe UDP stands for Unified Data Protection. With ArcServe UDP, we can protect both virtual and physical machines, and we can manage these through a unified console. We can start from a basic data protection and go up to uh, quite sophisticated features available in the product. And the bulk of our differentiation in the market and our competitors comes from the use of our recovery point server. This is a Windows server where we can enable global source side dedupe. So any backups going in to a data store on the recovery point server can be deduplicated at the source, meaning you save not only disk space from the deduplication, but you're also saving on bandwidth as well as the time it takes to perform a backup. Once we have data in a recovery point server, we then have the ability to perform additional functions such as replicating that, uh, performing virtual standby or instant VM, performing copy to tape and so on. Let's take a look in a bit more detail how the solution goes together. As I mentioned, we can start with a very basic data protection model using ArcServe UDP. If you have a physical server, or indeed if you have a, a virtual server and you want to protect and back that up, we can start by deploying an agent onto that machine. We can log into that agent, configure the backups, and the backups can be sent to a file share, whether on a NAS or a file server, or to another hard drive, maybe a USB hard drive as an example. The backups we perform can be compressed and we can encrypt them for additional security. If you have multiple machines, then we need to deploy and configure the agents on those separately. 
Now, when you start having more than a handful of servers, this can become quite time consuming. So what we can then do is add what we call the UDP console into the environment. The UDP console is a Windows-based machine and we can log into the console and we can centrally configure plans which contain all our backup policies, the sources, the schedules and so on. And from the console we can manage the agents and push all these settings in the plan out to the agent. At the same time, if we add more servers into our environment, from the console we can actually push the agents out to these new machines. Furthermore, once we add a UDP console in the mix, we can also do agentless backups of Hyper-V and VMware VM. To do this, we employ the use of a proxy machine, which again uses our agent, and the destination is to a share again. And once we have our console in place, we can also perform features such as virtual standby. With virtual standby, we take a backup image as the source, and using that, we will create a powered off VM in Hyper-V or VMware, and now in 6.5, also in Amazon AWS, and we can create a powered off VM that has the data consistent as of that backup source, ready to turn on in the event the original machine fails or if we want to bring up that server as a migration or as in a new destination. The last piece is that recovery point server that I mentioned before. So with the recovery point server, and note that in this diagram, the recovery point server and the UDP console are shown as two separate machines, but this is just for the diagram. In real life, in real deployments, we can have the console and the recovery point server on the same machine if you like. With that said, once we introduce a recovery point server role, we need to configure a data store. This is where the backups are going to be saved and kept. This can be on a local disk or a SAN-based disk, or it could be on a share. Once we add a recovery point server, we can also enable things such as the Exchange Online Backup from Office 365, as well as backups from UNC pubs or file shares. As I mentioned, we can enable deduplication on these backups to the recovery point server, and of course, we still have compression and encryption as options as well. We still have the ability to perform virtual standby, but we now also add the ability to perform an instant VM. Instant VM is related to virtual standby in that we're creating a virtual machine, but the way we do it is slightly different. With instant VM, we're not doing a conversion and creating that powered off VM ready to turn on. What we're doing instead is we're creating a VM when needed, and we are using a combination of the original recovery point, the backup, as the source image, and we're then using what we call a differencing virtual disk to store any changes on new write. So by doing this, we can stand an instant VM up without needing any additional disk space up front. However, the performance might be a little slower than a traditional virtual standby. If you plan on using an instant VM on a more long-term basis, we can perform tasks such as a vMotion or a VM replication to get the data onto a, um, a full-speed disk on the hypervisor. That said, we also can perform copy to tape. What copy to tape does is it takes a recovery point in the recovery point server, it'll rehydrate that to full and send it to tape. The benefit of this is that because we have a full copy of the data on tape, we can perform an individual file or folder restore directly from the tape without having to do a dump restore of our data store itself. We see customers using this typically on a monthly or perhaps quarterly basis where they're then performing a full backup of their environment and sending it to tape for long-term retention for, for compliance or legal reasons. 
I also mentioned we can do replication. If you have an additional recovery point server, we can replicate recovery points or the backups from one recovery point server to another. Once that data is replicated, we can then perform tasks such as remote instant VM and remote virtual standby. Or we can do a remote copy to take. If you have multiple sites, maybe branch offices, they can all replicate back to a central location and then that can perform a copy to take so that you don't have to invest in putting tape devices in all of the sites and you don't have to worry about non-IT staff having to perform tasks such as tape rotation. So you can see here we started with a really basic way to do backup of a single server, but the UDP product is flexible enough to grow with your environment as it grows. That was a very high level overview and we have held some webinars in the past that covered different components. Now, if you want to watch those webinars on demand, the links are on the screen there. I'll leave them for just a few seconds. We had a basic series which covered the agent, the console, and the recovery point server separately, and we went into some detail about the functionalities you can get with those components. We then expanded on that with the features series, where we added the uh, webinars to show how you can perform uh, bare metal and granular restores, how to do replication, virtual standby and instant VM on-prem, and then we're looking at cloud and tape integration. We've also, uh, last time, we had our webinar one on the UDP 6.5 new features, where we looked at the UNC or file share backup, exchange online backup, assured recovery, and VM auto protection. So the webinar link to view that on demand is also on screen. So let's take a quick look and see a list of all the key new features that have been introduced in UDP 6.5. These can be classified in three broad areas, fortified data availability, further cloud integration, and expanded reporting and orchestration. What do this mean? For fortified data avail availability, what this means is we've added additional support for hardware snapshots or array-based systems. So in UDP version 6, we introduced hardware snapshotting by adding support for NetApp Array. We also, in, uh, in an update in UDP 6, we added support for Nimble Arrays for Hyper-V and agent-based backups. And now in 6.5, we've further enhanced that by adding support for Nimble for VMware. So now we support uh, all uh, Hyper-V VMware and agent-based backup for Nimble. We've also added that support for HPE 3 par array. As we saw in some of the previous slides, and as I mentioned, we've added support for Office 365 Exchange Online backups. So we can protect mailboxes that are running in Exchange Online. We can back those up and bring them down and hold them on-prem. We can do restores back into the cloud and so on. So we've got that uh, extra peace of mind that can be uh, gained through having a local backup of your emails, even if you're using uh, Exchange Online. Backup from UNC parts or, or file shares. This allows us to perform backups of shares on systems that perhaps didn't have agent support or uh, weren't virtual machines with the previous versions of UDP. And this includes NAS devices. Perhaps you might have uh, a Synology or a QNAP type NAS box, and we can now protect data on those shares using ArcServe UDP 6.5. And we've also added new certifications. We've added support for Windows Server 2016, uh, updated support for vSphere, Red Hat, added support for the unbreakable kernel with Oracle Enterprise Linux. From a cloud integration, this is what we'll be focusing on today. So we've added the ability to perform a copy recovery point to cloud, specifically into AWS S3. So we'll see how we can configure that in, uh, in an upcoming uh, slide. 
But we can also perform uh, enhanced protection of both EC2 instances, but also do restore into EC2 uh, through different methods. So what we're going to do is perform, uh, we can perform virtual standby into Amazon AWS EC2 for Windows hosts, and we can perform instant VM recovery for Linux hosts into AWS EC2. So we're going to take a look at how we can perform both of these and what the requirements are. And essentially what this does is it makes it a lot more feasible to utilize AWS as a remote DR site if you need to. Lastly, from expanded reporting and orchestration, we added the automated testing for Windows and Linux. This is called the ArcServe Assured Recovery feature allows you to automatically create a VM or create a virtual disk from the backup that was just made, and you can then run custom scripts against it to test if the backup is functional, if the data you need is there, and if particular services you need will start from that backup image. We've added the ability to create more uh, detailed SLA reports, so we can get both RTO, recovery time objective reports, and RPOs, recovery point objective reports. RTOs will let you see how long it takes to actually perform different types of restores, and you can create SLA profiles where you define how many minutes, hours, or days you need, or what your um, uh, SLA needs to be, uh, what your RTO needs to be to do those restores. So for example, for file-based restores, you might say, I need to be able to perform a file restore in less than 15 minutes. For an instant VM, you might say, I need to be able to create an instant VM in less than 30 minutes. If you're doing a VM restore, maybe I need to restore an entire VM in less than two hours. Or if I'm doing a, a complete bare metal restore, maybe I have a four-hour window for that. So when you go ahead and test and perform these different kinds of restores, UDP will time them and compare them against what you've set in the profile, and you can generate a report to see if that SLA has been met or if it hasn't been met. Of course, there's also been a lot of additional enhancements, uh, improvements made, not only in the back end, but some changes and updates in the user interface as well. For example, when creating um, VMware-based instant VMs or virtual standby, you can choose a disk controller type. Uh, we can do the online, uh, sorry, uh, automatic VM protection for VMware VMs, and a host of other enhancements uh, just listed there. Now let's take a look at the features that we'll be fo focusing on today. First one being the copy recovery point to cloud. From, the, from UDP's first release, we've had the ability to perform a copy of recovery point. In fact, copy recovery point was a feature that was available even with ArcServe D2D. What copy recovery point does is it lets you take a particular backup, maybe your daily or weekly or monthly, and it will make that recovery point a standalone recovery point, meaning it's a full recovery point that doesn't need any other fulls or incrementals previous to that. It'll make it a standalone recovery point, and it will let you copy it to another location. Previously, that was another uh, to another drive or to a share. With UDP 6.5, we've also now added the ability to send a copy of that recovery point to Amazon S3. We can configure this so that uh, the copy recovery point is done automatically for particular backups and then sent into S3. Or we can perform a manual upload of a recovery point into Amazon S3. Essentially what this lets you do is keep those standalone backups in cloud on a more cost-effective storage tier in the cloud, being object store. If you then need to do a restore, you can download the recovery point and do a local restore as you would normally. With that said, let's take a look at how we'd actually configure and perform this. 
So I'm just going to open my ArcServe UDP console. So logging in, we will come up with the um, the dashboard. So we'll see so the status of backups, uh, you know, recovery point, recovery time, uh, reports, and so on. From here, we're going to go to the resources tab because that's where we do most of our configuration. And in the resources tab, you'll see here I have a list of different servers. I have a list of physical, virtual, Windows, Linux, server, workstations, and so on. What we're going to do is going to configure and update a plan so that we can perform regular copies of recovery points into S3. Now what I'm going to do, I want to, I want to do this on my domain controller. So I have a backup of my domain controller image in the cloud. Right now I can see that this is my domain controller. I've called it DC01. And this is part of this DC01 backup plan. So what I'm going to do is go to all plans. I'm going to select my DC01 backup plan. So if I click on this, I'll go in to modify it. You can see here I already have a number of different tasks being performed on the backup for this image. Like I'm replicating it, I'm performing a local virtual standby, and I'm doing a copy to tape. I'm going to click on add a task. So here if I click add a task, it's going through and checking the different connectivity for the previous task. And now I've got task five here and I can choose what that task type is going to be. So I'm going to say copy recovery points from this drop down. I'm going to choose which backups I want to perform a copy. So I want to do a copy of my weeklies and monthlies into the cloud. I'm not too worried about my dailies. So for weeklies and monthlies, let them copy in. I then go to copy settings. And then I can choose the destination. So this could be a local disk or a shared folder, and I'd put the path in there. But what we want is cloud storage. We're going to choose cloud. And in the drop-down list for the service, we've got the choice of Amazon S3 or S3 compatible. Uh, S3 and S3 compatible are obviously very similar uh, options. With S3, we can choose to add an S3 account in if we don't already have one. And you'll notice that we only have a small subset of the bucket regions within the S3 option. What we can do is we can choose S3 compatible and we can add a service in. And when we choose an S3 compatible account, we can define the storage endpoint. So if we wanted to send to Sydney, for example, we can put the Sydney endpoint address in, put in our credentials in, and a bucket name. Now, I've already done that. So in the drop-down, I've created this storage account that we're using in this bucket. We're going to choose compression and encryption options. And then once we've configured the copy settings, we're going to the schedule. And we're going to choose when we want the copy recovery point to happen. Now, by default, this is blank, which means that immediately after the backup finishes, it'll perform a copy to cloud or the copy recovery point task. We can then also choose what the retention or how many recovery points we want to keep in our destination, i.e. cloud. So I'm happy to keep one weekly and one monthly. That's going to be my if there's a complete site failure and I've lost everything, I know that I have a backup. My last weekly and my last monthly are going to be available in the cloud. If I wanted to put a schedule in, I can click Add, and then Add Recovery Point Job Schedule, and I can choose which days of the week to run and what the start and end times are going to be. 
This is for the kickoff. So once the job has started replicating, it'll continue until it actually copies the recovery point. It won't stop the copy when this time is reached. It's only this is the time during which it can start the copy. But for me right now, I'm happy to let the copy run immediately after backup. I'll hit save. And now what it's going to do, it's going to push those settings to the agent on that particular machine. And then the next time that a backup runs, it'll perform uh, a copy of the recovery point of the weekly and monthly when those particular backups run. Now while that's pushing out, we also have the ability to perform a manual upload of recovery points into the cloud as well. So to do that, we're going to click, click on all nodes. And we just need to wait for the plan to deploy, which it has. And then if I want to perform a copy of recovery point, I can right click on this node. And then in the menu that pops up, there's an option to upload recovery point to cloud. So I can click on that. I can choose which recovery point I want to copy. So this is my daily backup, the last one that ran uh, yesterday at 11.30 at night. Let's say I want to copy this. I'll select the recovery point that I want to copy. I'll go next. I'll choose which cloud service or which account I want to use. So I'm using my S3 compatible Sydney destination. Standard compression and no encryption is fine. And I'll hit finish. And what this will do is then kick off the copy recovery point into the cloud. So in a few seconds we should see a spinning wheel next to this. And now that that's spinning, if we go to jobs, we can see that the copy recovery point job is in progress. If we click on details, we can get some more information about what's happening. Now, in this case, this image is about 32 and a half gig, and depending on how fast your internet connection and link is, obviously this could take you know, from, depending on how big it is, from you know maybe an hour or two to uh, days. So it really does does vary. I'm going to let this run in the meantime, so I'm just going to close this window. And we'll go back to our resources tab. And then if you want to then download a recovery point from the cloud, you can right click on the machine in question. And then there's a download recovery point from cloud option. So if we click on this, We'll choose you know, our source, so I've got the Sydney account here. Now obviously it hasn't finished uploading anything, so we don't have any recovery points in the cloud. But if we did, we'd select it and we'd click next. And then we would choose the destination on where we want to save that recovery point. Once that's back on-prem, we can perform a mount recovery point, we can perform a bare metal restore, we can browse fi or find files or folders in that recovery point all the recovery options that are available to us normally will be available on that recovery point as well. Okay. Let's take a look at virtual standby now into AWS. So virtual standby is available for Windows hosts and what it does is it lets us, as I said, take a recovery point or a backup that we've performed and use that as a source and create a powered off VM or an EC2 instance in this case. 
And what we do is we take that and create the, uh, the relevant EBS and the instance behind it and have that as a powered off instance ready to turn on when needed. What we can also do is if we're using an RPS server in EC2, we can replicate the recovery point from one RPS to the other. What this does is it lets us replicate the dedupe data, which makes it a, a WAN optimized replication. And because if we do the conversion or the creation of the virtual standby from the RPS in the cloud in EC2, the data is local to the cloud, which would make that conversion and creation quicker. That said, you don't have to have that RPS in the cloud, but in both instances, you do need to have a Windows instance running in EC2 to act as a proxy for the virtual standby. That Windows instance needs to have the ArcServe agent installed in it, and of course, the proxy needs to be able to communicate with the UDP console and the recovery point service. So let's take a look at how we configure this in the console. So I'll go back to my UDP console. So what we're going to do is perform a virtual standby for this demo O2 machine here that I've been backing up. So this is part of this agent with Hyper-V plan. And just to show you, we can actually do this conversion across hypervisors. So I'm going to go to plans. I'm going to go to my agentless Hyper-V plan. And it's doing a backup at the moment. What I want to do now is add another task. And this task will be a virtual standby. Now, if I did have, if I did want to use an RPS in Amazon EC2, what I could do is perform a replicate task first that goes to the RPS in the cloud. And then when I add virtual standby, here in the source where it says destination of task one, I would have an additional option that says destination of task to replicate. So I could choose the replica as the source for my virtual standby. For now, I'm just going to choose uh, the, uh, the backup that I've done on-prem. And then here in the virtualization server, I have options for VMware or Hyper-V. These, these are if I am doing an on-prem virtual standby or a remote virtual standby into a, a DR site or maybe to a colo where I have uh, equipment that I can manage, the Hyper-V or the VMware host that I can manage. To go to cloud, I'll select EC2. And here, I can choose an account name. Now, I've already got one created. But if we were to uh, add a new account, we would just put in the name that you want to give it, the label, and then we're going to choose which uh, EC2 account to create. So we'll do that. Provide your key access key ID and secret access key and go OK, and it'll use those account credentials. As I said, I've already created one, so I'm going to select my account here. And then we're going to select the region. So here we've got, I'm going to choose Sydney in this list. And then we need to define which Windows instance in AWS are we going to be using as the proxy. So I'm going to click on this and it automatically is seeing what machines I have running in AWS against the account that I've chosen. So I've actually got an instance here that I've named proxy. I do have an RPS running in Amazon, even though I'm not using it. So I could use the RPS itself as a proxy if I wanted to. And I have a Linux box, and that's to show the instant VM later. For now, I'm going to choose the AWS proxy. This is just a Windows 2012 R2 instance. 
and then I need to provide the username and the password. Now, oops, I have to get my account details here, so bear with me. So I have not joined this instance to my domain, so I will have to use the local admin password. Once you put those details in, we can then click on virtual machine. If there are any issues or errors with the credentials or details you provided, you'd get an error message. But for now, we can now configure the virtual machine setting. So what this is going to do is it's going to create an instance and it's going to put this UDP VM underscore before that name. We also have the ability to choose how many snapshots we want to keep in the virtual standby. So we can keep up to 29 snapshots. What this means is if we need to start the, the, the virtual machine instance, we can pick which snapshot to apply to the image. So you're not limited to starting the last backup. For example, if you were hit by crypto lock and you didn't realize for two or three days that you have the last five days of backups of snapshots available on the virtual standby, you could start the virtual standby instance with an image or the backup from three days ago or four days ago. We then have the option to choose the instance type. So there's a, uh, the different types of instances available within uh, EC2. So I'm going to start this as a small instance. We can choose what kind of EBS volume you want to use. So I'm happy with the general purpose. If you, depending on what your network settings are and your security groups in Amazon, you can choose what's available. So I've just got some defaults here, which I'll select. And then under advanced, you can choose uh, what the heartbeat is. So you can choose to check how often you're going to check against the source if it's running. If, and whether you want to enable email alerts. You also have the option of adding a throttle for the data transfer. So if you have a limited pipe going into the, into the internet, if you add a throttle, you can choose a particular limit in megabits or kilobits, and you can choose, you know, maybe I only want to use one megabit of traffic between 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. Monday to Friday so that it doesn't impact my business if they need to use the internet for, for, for business purposes. So I can put a throttle schedule in if I need to as well. Once that's done, I hit save. Again, what it will do is it will push all these settings out to the host or to the agents on the proxy in this case, because it's an agentless backup. If I come to all nodes, that's currently deploying. Now, if I go to the jobs list, I actually have a virtual standby that I started earlier and this is going into the cloud as well. So this is for a server called Demo01. If I look at the details here, um, it's, my link is not the greatest or the fastest link, so it's been taking quite a bit of time uh, to copy this 23 gig up. But this is going into um, AWS. If I take a look in my EC2 management console, you'll be able to see the three instances that we saw before. I have my Linux instance that's running my uh, that's running as a Linux backup server. I have my proxy machine, which we just used now for the virtual standby, and I have my RPS that's running in the cloud as well. You'll also notice that this UDP VM demo01 instance has been created that is currently stopped. So what's happening now, if I go back to my UDP console, this upload is uploading all this data into an EBS volume attached to that PowerDoc instance. So once this completes the upload, 
I'll be able to power on that instance and it will be as if I've uh, powered that demo or one machine on from the blast back up. So coming back to resources here, you can still see it's deploying and now it's deployed. So what will happen is the next time the backup runs, this uh, will automatically create the virtual standby into the cloud. Lastly, let's take a look on how to do instant VM into Amazon AWS. So with instant VM, as we said, it's related to virtual standby. And while it's similar in some respects, the way that we go about doing restores is different. So with Instant VM, uh, to do Instant VM, first of all, it's only available for Linux machines being protected. And in order to use Instant VM into Amazon, we need to have a recovery point server in the cloud that has a recovery point from a Linux server replicated to it. We also need a Linux instance to be running in the cloud that has the ArcServe UDP agent for Linux installed on it. And that machine is referred to as a Linux backup server. And its role is similar to the virtual standby proxy. The creation of the instant VM and the sending of the data to the instant VM is achieved through the Linux backup server itself. So if you've got those two components in place, we can then perform uh, instant VM into Amazon AWS for Linux machines. So let's take a look at how that works. So again, I'll go back to my console. And then what we've got is uh, this machine here. I've got an Ubuntu VM, and I'm backing that up with this agentless backup, and that's called agentless VMware. So this is running on a VMware host I have. If I go to plans, and if we go to agentless VMware, you can see that I have the backup task for this Ubuntu VM, and then I'm replicating it. So if I click on replicate, the destination is going to my RPS in the cloud, AWS RPS. I'll cancel that. And if I go in my console, if you're familiar with the UDP console, if we click on recovery point servers here under destinations, you can see I have a third recovery point server with a data store. And so this is backed up. This is holding just over 15 gig of data, but I'm getting 61% dedupe, 41% compression. So even though I'm backing up and holding 15 gig of data, I'm only using just under three and a half of actual gig space. All right, so now that I've established that I have you know, my recovery point server in the cloud, I've replicated, and if I go into the data store here, I have five recovery points for this Ubuntu machine. So I've, all my prerequisites are fine. And if I click on Linux Backup Server Groups, you can see that I have this EC2 instance as my Linux Backup Server as well. So that's already added in as well. If that wasn't there, I can click on Add Nodes. And then I can choose to add a Linux Backup Server node. And then I would provide my uh, credentials and details for that machine in here and click Add to List. But again, I've already gone ahead and done that. So there's my Linux backup server showing in my list, which means I can go to my node list and I can right click on this Ubuntu machine and then I can say create an instant VM. So I'm gonna create an instant VM. <clears throat> and by default, it'll show me the first recovery point where the backup goes to, which is RPS01. But I don't want RPS01, I want AWS RPS. So I'm going to select the RPS 
in the cloud. That's the data store. And then let's say I want to stand up the latest backup. So by default, it highlights the latest recovery point. I'm OK with that. We'll select that. We'll then go next. It's automatically detected that we're running in EC2. If we needed to change the cloud type, we could. Choose the account we're going to use. And then we're going to go next. We then need to select the Linux backup server. So this is the, the proxy, essentially, that will be used. So we'll go through the one we have. And then we need to set the VM settings. So we can put a description in. You can see here it automatically puts an UDP IVM underscore prefix before the node name. So I'm happy with that. That's fine. I want to run it in Sydney, so that's fine. And then the instance type, this can be a small instance as well. General purpose is fine. Network settings and all of that is fine. I'm let, happy to let it auto assign an IP. Select the security group. And we can hit finish. You can choose whether you want to boot now or boot later. So we can say boot now. And then you can see it's in the process of going through and creating that instant VM. That's pretty much all it is for the, uh, the Linux instant VM in Amazon. Now just to give a bit of an update on the new features and functions in UDP 6.5. With UDP, um, as we had with the previous version, with UDP 6.5, we have four server editions, and we have the ArcServe UDP appliance. So the capabilities available on the different editions from the new features perspective, we can perform backup of UNC paths with all editions of UDP. If you want to do auto VM protection for VMware, if you want to do instant VM or virtual standby into Amazon EC2, or if you want support for the Oracle Unbreakable kernel, then you need UDP Advanced or higher. And the, and the appliance will also do that. And then if you want to take advantage of hardware snapshotting on HPE 3PAR, Nimble, or NetApp, or if you want to be able to perform the Assured Recovery Tests and SLA reports, you'll need UDP Premium or Premium Plus. If you have the appliance, there is an upgrade option that lets you add the premium features to the appliance. For Office 365 backup, that's included with the appliance, and it's also included on all managed capacity licenses. So in that case, basically whatever backup size your exchange online takes comes out of your allowance for those licenses. Otherwise, if you're using a per OS or per socket license, there's an optional subscription available to be able to back up Exchange Online. These subscription licenses are available as 10 user packs, and you can get them in one year and three year subscription options. With that, um, I'll open it up to questions. Before we get into that though, if you are interested in a deep dive or if you're after any more information, whether it's of a technical or commercial nature, um, please feel free to reach out to us. Um, we have uh, my contact details, as well as my colleagues, Andrew Huntley and Dean Schroeder. Um, I'll leave our contact details on screen for the time being. And I'll open it up if anyone has any questions. So I've got one here asking about, do I need to have a recovery point server in the cloud for virtual standby? The short answer is no. But if you do have a, if you are using one or if you want to use one, it can speed up the creation of the virtual standby instance. 
because getting the data into the cloud, you'll be replicating deduped and compressed data from one RPS to another RPS. And then from the RPS in the cloud, it'll be able to create the virtual standby instance quicker. Another question about copy recovery point. When copying it to S3, does it send the whole recovery point? Yes. So with recovery, copy recovery point, what we're doing is with, if it's an incremental, we're, we're taking a copy of that out of the chain. We're making it a standalone full recovery point and then sending that into cloud. That said, you do have the option to compress it and you also have option to encrypt it. So it won't necessarily be the full size of the backup, so you, but you might get some saving due to compression, but the amount of saving will depend on the data type. But the, uh, to answer the question, yes, when you do copy the recovery, copy recovery point to S3, it does a copy of the whole recovery point. Another question that's come up here. It's uh, make it easier to read. There's a question about an objective to put monthly full backups to tape using the least media possible. Is there a way to use the copy recovery point to copy each object monthly full backup? to another deduplicated data store, or to modify a replicate feature to only replicate a monthly full backup to another deduplicated data store? Uh, the short answer is yes. So to completely automate it, you can replicate from one data store to another data store. Previously, you have to have two separate RPS servers to do that. With UDP 6.5, we can do that uh, on the same RPS. So you can have to set up two separate data stores. Uh, if your objective is to uh, shut down the data store and just have that on tape, um, what you could do is a, a two-step process. You could do a copy recovery point and then import that or jump start that into a data store. But uh, realistically, you know, there's a lot of ways that we can get a copy of the data store to and back that up. And within the ARCS of uh, UDP solution guide, there's also a section on how to back up the data stores to tape. So if you back up the data store to tape, you're backing up the entire data store in a deduplicated state, and you'll have a copy of all of the recovery points available. However, in order to restore from that, you would need to dump the entire contents of the data store first to a recovery point server. So yes, there are ways to do it. Um, copy recovery point might not be the most efficient way, but we do have ways to achieve um, having an, a, a, a separate deduplicated copy of your data. So there's a question about the copy recovery point. Can it be done over a standard internet connection? Uh, the answer is yes, but again, depending on how much data you have, it could take a fair, it could take a bit of time. So with my internet connection that I have, it's taking it's taken over 24 hours to do a copy. It might take another 24. So one that uh, you know that will be the uh, the deciding factor on on feasibility and how often you can do that. Okay, taking a look at the time, if there are no other questions, um, I'll probably leave it at that. I'd like to thank you for attending. Uh, if there are any other questions you think of afterwards, again, uh, my details are on screen. Please feel free to send an email or give me a call.
more than happy to uh, answer any questions that may come up afterwards. But until our next webinar, I'd like to say thank you and uh, see you next time.